Please be seated. The sitting is open. The court meets today pursuant to Article 58 of its statute and Article 94 of its rules to read out in open court its judgment on the preliminary objection raised by the respondent in the case concerning the arbitral award of 3 October 1899, Guyana versus Venezuela. For reasons made known to me, the Vice President and Judges Benuna, Sebatinde, and Robinson, who duly participated in the deliberation and the final vote in this case, are unable to sit with us today. I recall that the proceedings in this case were instituted on 29 March 2018 by the Cooperative Republic of Guyana against the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela with respect to a dispute concerning the legal validity and binding effect of the award regarding the boundary between the colony of British Guyana and the United States of Venezuela of 3 October 1899, to which I shall refer as the 1899 award or the award. In its judgment of 18 December 2020, to which I shall refer as the 2020 judgment, the court found that it had jurisdiction to entertain the application filed by Guyana on 29 March 2018 insofar as it concerns the validity of the arbitral award of 3 October 1899 and the related question of the definitive settlement of the land boundary dispute between Guyana and Venezuela. The court also found that it did not have jurisdiction to entertain the claims of Guyana arising from events that occurred after the signature of the agreement to resolve the controversy between Venezuela and the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland over the frontier between Venezuela and British Guyana, signed at Geneva on 17 February 1966, to which I shall refer as the Geneva Agreement. I further recall that on 7 June 2022, within the time limit prescribed by Article 79 bis paragraph 1 of the Rules of Court, Venezuela raised preliminary objections which it characterized as objections to the admissibility of the application. Consequently, the proceedings on the merits were suspended. In accordance with the usual practice, I shall not read out the introductory paragraphs of the judgment, which set out the main elements in the procedural history of the case. I shall also omit some paragraphs and summarize others. I shall therefore begin reading the judgment at paragraph 27. The full text of the judgment will, of course, be available at the close of the sitting. At the outset, the court notes that Venezuela refers in, in the preliminary objections submitted on 7 June 2022 to Guyana's possible lack of standing and that the final submissions of Venezuela includes references to its preliminary objections in the plural. However, the court understands Venezuela to be making in substance only a single preliminary objection based on the argument that the United Kingdom is an indispensable third party without the consent of which the court cannot adjudicate upon the dispute. The court will address the party's arguments concerning Venezuela's preliminary objection on this basis. The United Kingdom and Venezuela both claimed the territory located between the mouth of the Essequibo River in the east and the Orinoco River in the west. In the, 19, sorry, in the 1890s, the United States of America encouraged both parties to submit their territorial claims to arbitration. A treaty of arbitration entitled the Treaty between Great Britain and the United States of Venezuela respecting the settlement of the boundary between the colony of British Guyana and the United States of Venezuela was signed in Washington on 2 February 1897. The arbitral tribunal established under the aforementioned Washington Treaty rendered its award on 3 October 1899. The following year, a joint Anglo-Venezuelan commission was charged with demarcating the boundary established by the 1899 award. On 10 January 1905, after the boundary had been demarcated, the British and Venezuelan commissioners produced an official boundary map and signed an agreement accepting inter alia 
that the coordinates of the points listed were correct. On 14 February 1962, Venezuela informed the Secretary General of the United Nations and the Fourth Committee of the General Assembly that it considered there to be a dispute between itself and the United Kingdom concerning the demarcation of the frontier between Venezuela and Br British Guyana, and it alleged that the 1899 award was null and void. The United Kingdom, for its part, rejected that contention. Over the following years, efforts to resolve the dispute were made by representatives of Venezuela, the United Kingdom, and British Guiana, which led to the signing of the Geneva Agreement on 17 February 1966. On 26 May 1966, Guyana, having attained independence, became a party to the Geneva Agreement alongside the governments of the United Kingdom and Venezuela in accordance with the provisions of Article 8 thereof. The Geneva Agreement provides first for the establishment of a mixed commission comprised of representatives appointed by the government of British Guyana and the government of Venezuela to seek a settlement of the controversy between the parties. In addition, Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the Geneva Agreement states that should this commission fail in its task, the governments of Guyana and Venezuela shall choose one of the means of peaceful settlement provided for in Article 33 of the Charter of the United Nations. In accordance with Article 4, Paragraph 2, should those governments fail to reach agreement, the decision as to the means of settlement shall be made by an appropriate international organ upon which they both agree, or, failing that, by the Secretary General of the United Nations. The Mixed Commission was established in 1966 and reached the end of its mandate in 1970 without having arrived at a solution. It fell, therefore, to Venezuela and Guyana, under Article 4 of the Geneva Agreement, to choose one of the means of peaceful settlement provided for in Article 33 of the Charter of the United Nations. Pursuant to a moratorium on the dispute settlement process adopted in a protocol to the Geneva Agreement and signed on 18 June 1970, the operation of Article 4 of the Geneva Agreement was suspended for a period of 12 years. The application of Article 4 of that agreement was resumed from 18 June 1982. The parties attempted to reach an agreement on the choice of one of the means of peaceful settlement provided for in Article 33 of the Charter of the United Nations. However, they failed to do so within the three-month time limit set out in Article 4, Paragraph 2. They also failed to agree on the choice of an appropriate international organ to decide on the means of settlement as provided for in Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the Geneva Agreement. The parties therefore proceeded to the next step, referring the decision on the means of settlement to the Secretary General of the United Nations. In early 1990, the Secretary General chose the good offices process as the appropriate means of settlement. Between 1990 and 2014, the good office process was led by three personal representatives appointed by successive Secretaries General. In September 2015, during the 70th session of the United Nations General Assembly, the Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, held a meeting with the heads of state of Guyana and Venezuela. Thereafter, on 12 November 2015, the Secretary General issued a document entitled The Way Forward, in which he informed the parties that, I quote, if a practical solution to the controversy were not found before the end of his tenure, he intended to initiate the process to obtain a final and binding decision from the International Court of Justice." End of quote. In his statement of 16 December 2016, the Secretary General stated that he had decided to continue for a further year the good offices process to be led by a new personal representative with a strengthened mandate of mediation. After taking office on 1 January 2017, the new Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, continued the good offices process for a final year in conformity with his predecessor's decision. In letters dated 30 January 2018 to both parties, the Secretary General stated that he had carefully analyzed 
the developments in the good offices process during the course of 2017 and concluded that, I quote, significant progress not having been made toward arriving at a full agreement for the solution of the controversy, he had chosen the International Court of Justice as the means to be used for its solution. On 20 March 2018, Guyana filed its application in the registry of the court. The court then turned to the question of the admissibility of Venezuela's preliminary objection, addressing Guyana's argument that the objection concerns the exercise of the court's jurisdiction and should be rejected as inadmissible because it is jurisdictional in nature and is not an objection to admissibility. Guyana contends that in accordance with Article 79 bis of the Rules of Court, Venezuela is no longer entitled to raise a preliminary objection which in substance concerns questions of jurisdiction that the court raised propia moto and already decided in a binding judgment. Guyana argues that Venezuela's preliminary objection is in any event time barred because Venezuela could and should have raised its objection within the time limit fixed by the court's order of 19 June 2018. The court recalls that it has on a number of occasions considered whether a state that is not a party to the proceedings before it should be deemed an indispensable third party without the consent of which the court cannot adjudicate. In the operative paragraph of its judgment in the case concerning monetary gold removed from Rome in 1943, the court found that, I quote, the jurisdiction conferred upon it by the common agreement of France, the United Kingdom, the United States of America, and Italy does not, in the absence of the consent of Albania, authorize it to adjudicate upon the first submission in the application of the Italian government, end of quote. Similarly, in the case concerning East Timor, Portugal versus Australia, the court concluded that, I quote, it cannot, in this case, exercise the jurisdiction it has by virtue of the declarations made by the parties under Article 36, Paragraph 2 of its statute, because in order to decide the claims of Portugal, it would have to rule as a prerequisite on the lawfulness of Indonesia's conduct in the absence of that state's consent, end of quote. When rejecting an objection that a third state is an indispensable party without the consent of which the court cannot adjudicate in a given case, the court has proceeded on the basis that the objection concerning the exercise of jurisdiction rather than the existence of jurisdiction. For example, in the case concerning certain phosphate lands in Nauru, Nauru versus Australia, the court concluded that the court could decline to exercise its jurisdiction on the basis of the principle referred to as monetary gold. The aforecited jurisprudence is thus premised on a distinction between two different concepts. On the one hand, the exercise of the court's jurisdiction, and on the other, the existence of its jurisdiction. Only an objection concerning the existence of the court's jurisdiction can be characterized as an objection to jurisdiction. The court concludes that Venezuela's objection on the basis of the monetary gold principle is an objection to the exercise of the court's jurisdiction and thus does not constitute an objection to jurisdiction. The court turns next to the principle of res judicata, which is reflected in Articles 59 and 60 of the Statute of the Court. As the court has stated, that principle establishes the finality of the decision adopted in a particular case. The force of res judicata attaches not only to a judgment on the merits, but also to a judgment determining the court's jurisdiction, such as the court's 2020 judgment. Specifically, the operative part of a judgment of the court possesses the for force of res judicata. In order to determine what has been decided with the force of res judicata, it is also necessary to ascertain the content of the decision, the finality of which is guaranteed and it may be necessary to determine the meaning of the operative clause by reference to the reasoning set out in the judgment in question. If a matter has not in fact been determined expressly or by necessary implication, then no force of res judicata attaches to it. The court finds that the operative paragraph of the 2020 judgment and the reasoning underlying it only address questions concerning the existence of the court's jurisdiction 
Moreover, that judgment does not address, even implicitly, the issue of the exercise of jurisdiction by the court. In particular, the question whether the United States is an indispensable third, sorry, the question whether the United Kingdom is an indispensable third party without the consent of which the court could not exercise its jurisdiction was not determined by necessary implication in the 2020 judgment. It follows that the force of res judicata attaching to the 2020 judgment extends only to the question of the existence of the court's jurisdiction and does not bar the admissibility of Venezuela's preliminary objection. The court also notes that by using the phrases in the matter of jurisdiction and the question of jurisdiction of the court in its order of 19 June 2018, it was referring only to the existence and not to the exercise of jurisdiction. As to Guyana's argument that Venezuela's preliminary objection is time bound, the court states that its order of 19 June 2018 only concerned pleadings in respect of the question of the existence of the court's jurisdiction. In light of the court's aforementioned finding that Venezuela's preliminary objection is not an objection to the court's jurisdiction, the time limits that the court set out in the order of 19 June 2018 do not apply to pleadings with respect to such objection. Venezuela thus remained entitled to raise that objection within the time limit set out by Article 79 bis, Paragraph 1 of the Rules of Court. For these reasons, the court concludes that Venezuela's preliminary objection is admissible. The court then proceeds to the examination of this preliminary objection. The court recalls that in its preliminary objection, Venezuela submits that the United Kingdom is an indispensable third party in, to the proceedings and that the court cannot decide the question of the validity of the 1899 award in the United Kingdom's absence. Venezuela argues that a judgment of the court on the merits in this case would necessarily involve as a prerequisite an evaluation of the lawfulness of certain fraudulent conduct allegedly attributable to the United Kingdom in respect of the 1899 award. The court recalls that Venezuela, invoking the monetary gold principle, maintains that the legal interests of the United Kingdom would be the very subject matter of the court's decision in the present case. Nonetheless, the court notes that the two parties to these proceedings, as well as the United Kingdom, are parties to the Geneva Agreement on which the court's jurisdiction is based. It is therefore appropriate for the court to consider the legal implications of the United Kingdom being a party to the Geneva Agreement, which calls for an interpretation of the relevant provisions of the agreement. To interpret the Geneva Agreement, the court will apply the rules of treaty interpretation to be found in Articles 31 to 33 of the Vienna Convention. Although that convention is not in force between the parties and is not in any event applicable to instruments concluded before it entered into force, such as the Geneva Agreement, it is well established that those articles reflect rules of customary international law. In accordance with the rule of interpretation enshrined in Article 31, Paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention, a treaty must be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms of the treaty in their context and in light of its object and purpose. These elements of interpretation are to be considered as a whole. The court notes that the emphasis placed by the parties to the Geneva Agreement on British Guyana becoming independent is an important part of the context for purposes of interpreting Article 4 of the agreement. Indeed, its preamble makes clear that the United Kingdom participated in the elaboration of the agreement in consultation with the government of British Guyana. The preamble further indicates that in elaborating the agreement, the parties took into account the then forthcoming independence of British Guyana. The court also observes that references to Guyana in paragraphs one and two of article four presuppose the attainment of independence by British Guyana. This independence was attained on 26 May 1966, some three months after the conclusion of the agreement. On that date, Guyana became a party to the Geneva Agreement in accordance with Article 8 thereof. The court turns to Articles 1 and 2 of the Geneva Agreement, 
which address the initial stage of the process for the settlement of the dispute between the parties and identify the role of Venezuela and British Guyana in the establishment of a mixed commission to seek a practical settlement for the controversy between Venezuela and, and the United Kingdom. The court observes that while Article I of the agreement describes the dispute as one existing between the United Kingdom and Venezuela, Article II provides no role for the United Kingdom in the initial stage of the dispute settlement process. Rather, it places the responsibility for appointment of the representatives to the mixed commission on British Guyana and Venezuela. The court notes that the reference to British Guyana contained in Article II, which can be distinguished from references to the United Kingdom contained elsewhere in the treaty and particularly in Article I, supports the interpretation that the parties to the Geneva Agreement intended for Venezuela and British Guyana to have the sole role in the settlement of the dispute through the mechanism of the Mixed Commission. It is noteworthy that such an understanding was arrived at, notwithstanding that British Guyana was a colony which had not yet attained independence and was not yet a party to the treaty. The court notes that neither paragraph one nor paragraph two of article four of the Geneva Agreement contains any reference to the United Kingdom. These provisions, which set out the final stages of the process for the settlement of the dispute, refer only to the government of Guyana and the government of Venezuela and place upon them the responsibility to choose a means of peaceful settlement provided in Article 33 of the Charter of the United Nations or failing agreement on such means, the responsibility to refer the decision on the means to an appropriate international organization upon which they both agree. Failing agreement on that point, the parties would refer the matter to the Secretary General of the United Nations who would choose one of the means of settlement provided in Article 33 of the Charter of the United Nations. In the view of the court, this examination of the relevant provisions of the Geneva Agreement, in particular the detailed provisions of Article 4, shows the importance that the parties to the agreement attached to the conclusive resolution of the dispute. In that regard, the court recalls that in its 2020 judgment, it determined that the object and purpose of the agreement is to ensure a definitive resolution of the controversy between the parties. In interpreting paragraphs one and two, of Article 4 in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms in their context and in light of the agreement's object and purpose. The court concludes that the Geneva Agreement specifies particular roles for Guyana and Venezuela and that its provisions, including Article 8, do not provide a role for the United Kingdom in choosing or in participating in the means of settlement of the dispute pursuant to Article 4. Therefore, the court considers that the scheme established by Articles 2 and 4 of the Geneva Agreement reflects a common understanding of all parties to that agreement that the controversy which existed between the United Kingdom and Venezuela on 17 February 1966 would be settled by Guyana and Venezuela through one of the dispute settlement procedures envisaged in the agreement. The court further notes that when the United Kingdom accepted through the Geneva Agreement the scheme for the settlement of the dispute between Guyana and Venezuela without its involvement, it was aware that such settlement could involve the examination of certain allegations by Venezuela of wrongdoing by the authorities of the United Kingdom at the time of the disputed arbitration. In that respect, the court recalls that on 14 February 1962, Venezuela, through its permanent representative to the United Nations, informed the Secretary General that it considered there to be a dispute between the United Kingdom and itself concerning the demarcation of the frontier between Venezuela and British Guyana. In its letter to the Secretary General, Venezuela stated that, I quote, the award was the result of a political transaction carried out behind Venezuela's back and sacrificing its legitimate rights. The frontier was demarcated arbitrarily and no account was taken of the specific rules of the arbitral agreement or of the relevant principles of international law." End of quote. Venezuela reiterated its position in a statement before the Fourth Committee of the United Nations General Assembly 
delivered shortly thereafter on 22 February 1962. In a statement to the Fourth Committee of the United Nations General Assembly delivered on 12 November 1962, the Minister for External Relations of Venezuela said that the 1899 award arose in circumstances which were clearly prejudicial to the rights of Venezuela. He further added that, I quote, there was no arbitral award, properly speaking. There was a settlement. There was a political compromise. And by means of this decision, the three judges who held a majority disposed of Venezuelan territory, for the two British judges were not acting as judges. They were acting as government representatives, as advocates, rather than as judgment, judges, end of quote. In 13 November 1962, the government of the United Kingdom responded to Venezuela's statement at the Fourth Committee of the General Assembly. The United Kingdom emphatically rejected what it qualified as the most serious allegation of the Venezuelan Minister of External Relations that the members of the arbitral tribunal which rendered the award in 1899, I quote, came to their decision without reference to the rules of international law and to the other rules which the tribunal under the terms of the treaty ought to have applied, end of quote. The United Kingdom also rejected the allegations that the 1899 award was an improper compromise or a diplomatic compromise and stated that it could not agree that there could be any dispute over the questions settled by the award. In the same statement, the United Kingdom offered to discuss with Venezuela through diplomatic channels arrangements for tripartite examination of the documentary material relevant to the validity of the 1899 award. Following the tripartite examination, on 9 and 10 December 1965, the foreign ministers of the United Kingdom and Venezuela and the Prime Minister of British Guyana met in London to discuss a settlement of the dispute. As the court noted in its 2020 judgment, in the discussion held on 9 and 10 December 1965, the United Kingdom and British Guyana rejected the Venezuelan proposal that the only solution to the frontier dispute lay in the return of the disputed territory to Venezuela on the basis that it implied that the 1899 award was null and void and that there was no justification for that allegation. After the failure of these talks, the United Kingdom participated in the negotiating, negotiation and conclusion of the Geneva Agreement. The court is of the view that the United Kingdom was aware of the scope of the dispute concerning the validity of the 1899 award, which included allegations of its wrongdoing and recourse to unlawful procedures, but nonetheless accepted the scheme set, set out in Article 4, whereby Guyana and Venezuela could submit the dispute to one of the means of settlement set out in Article 33 of the Charter of the United Nations without the involvement of the United Kingdom. The court considers that the ordinary meaning of the terms of Article 4 read in their context and in light of the object and purpose of the Geneva Agreement, as well as the circumstances surrounding its adoption, support this conclusion. The court refers next to Article 31, Paragraph 3 of the Vienna Convention, which provides that in the interpretation of a treaty, there shall be taken into account, together with the context, any subsequent practice in the application of the treaty which establishes the agreement of the parties regarding its interpretation. Accordingly, the court examines the subsequent practice of the parties to the Geneva Agreement to ascertain whether it establishes their agreement on the lack of involvement of the United Kingdom in the settlement of the dispute between Guyana and Venezuela. The court observes that the United Kingdom did not seek to participate in the aforementioned mixed commission procedure, nor did Venezuela and Guyana request the United Kingdom's participation. Venezuela's exclusive engagement with the government of Guyana at the Mixed Commission indicates that there was a common understanding among the parties that Article 2 did not provide a role for the United Kingdom in the dispute settlement process. The Court further notes that Venezuela engaged exclusively with the government of Guyana when implementing Article 4 of the Geneva Agreement. In respect of the good offices process conducted by the Secretary General of the United Nations, again, the Court observes that the United Kingdom did not seek to participate in the procedure set out in Article 4 to resolve the dispute, nor did the parties request such participation. Venezuela's exclusive engagement with the government of Guyana 
during the good offices process indicates that there was agreement among the parties that the United Kingdom had no role in the dispute settlement process. Accordingly, the practice of the parties to the Geneva Agreement further demonstrates their agreement that the dispute could be settled without the involvement of the United Kingdom. In light of the foregoing, the Court concludes that by virtue of being a party to the Geneva Agreement, the United Kingdom accepted that the dispute between Guyana and Venezuela could be settled by one of the means set out in Article 33 of the Charter of the United Nations and that it would have no role in that procedure. Under these circumstances, the Court considers that the monetary gold principle does not come into play in this case. It follows that if the Court, in its judgment on the merits, were called to pronounce on certain conduct attributable to the United Kingdom, which cannot be determined at present, this would not preclude the Court from exercising its jurisdiction, which is based on the application of the Geneva Agreement. The preliminary objection raised by Venezuela must therefore be rejected. I shall now read out the operative part of the judgment. For these reasons, the Court, one, unanimously finds that the preliminary objection raised by the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela is admissible. Two, by 14 votes to one, rejects the preliminary objection raised by the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. In favor, President Donahue, Vice President Gavorgian, Judges Tomka, Abraham, Benuna, Yusuf, Shwe, Sabatinde, Bandari, Robinson, Salam, Iwasawa, Nolte, Judge Ad Hoc, Wolfram. Against, Judge Ad Hoc, Couvreur. Three, by 14 votes to one, finds that it can adjudicate upon the merits of the claims of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana insofar as they fall within the scope of paragraph 138, subparagraph 1 of the judgment of 18 December 2020. In favor, President Donahue, Vice President Gavorgian, Judges Tomka, Abraham, Benuna, Yusuf, Shwe, Sebatinde, Bandari, Robinson, Salam, Iwasawa, Nolte, Judge Ad Hoc Wolfram. Against, Judge Ad Hoc Couvreur. I now call upon the Registrar to read the operative part of the judgment in French. Par ces motifs, la Cour, à l'unanimité, un, à l'unanimité, dit que l'exception préliminaire soulevée par la République bolivarienne du Venezuela est recevable, deux, par 14 voix contre une, rejette l'exception préliminaire soulevée par la République bolivarienne du Venezuela pour Madame Donoyou, présidente, Monsieur Gevorgian, vice-président, Messieurs Tomka, Abraham, Benouna, Youssouf, Mesdames Choué, Seboutinde, Messieurs Bandari, Robinson, Salam, Iwasawa, Nolt, juge, Monsieur Wolfroom, juge ad hoc, contre Monsieur Couvreur, juge ad hoc. Trois, par quatorze voix contre une, dit qu'elle peut statuer sur le fond des demandes de la République coopérative du Guyana dans la mesure où celle-ci entre dans le champ du point 1 du paragraphe 138 de l'arrêt du 18 décembre 2020. Pour Madame Donoyou, présidente, Monsieur Gevorgian, vice-président, Messieurs Tomka, Abraham, Benouna, Youssouf, Mesdames Choué, Seboutinde, Messieurs Bandari, Robinson, Salam, Iwasawa, Nolt, juge, Monsieur Wolfroom, juge ad hoc, contre Monsieur Couvreur, juge ad hoc. Judge Bandari appends a declaration to the judgment of the court. Judge Robinson appends a separate opinion to the judgment of the court. Judge Iwasawa appends a declaration to the judgment of the court. Judge Ad Hoc Wolfram appends a declaration to the judgment of the court. Judge Ad Hoc Couvreur appends a partially separate and partially dissenting opinion to the judgment of the court. The text of the judgment is available from today in TypeScript. It will also be available shortly on the court's website. The printed text will be available in the near future. As the court has no other business before it, I declare the sitting closed.